Amen. Well, church, this morning we are in the book of Daniel, chapter 12. We are finishing Daniel's prophecy. And as we wrap up this study, verse by verse, through the book of Daniel, it has been a wonderful study. I've truly uh, enjoyed it. I've learned a lot by preparing these sermons. It has sharpened uh, my understanding of biblical prophecy and uh, just uh, of, of how the Bible fits together. Uh, what I want you to see and, and what I want you to come away with it uh, from this study with is a deeper appreciation of how the biblical books fit together. Uh, we'll see again this morning that the later authors of Scripture interpret some of the things that we're going to read about in this passage this morning and explain it for us. And, and that's how you should read your Bible. You should read it from beginning to end, Old and New Testament. You should allow the later books to help you understand the earlier books that were written because no doubt as the Bible was written, the, the later prophets and the later authors and the Lord Jesus himself explained many of the things that we read here in the book of Daniel for us so that we can better understand them. And this morning the message is very simple and it is this, the end is coming. When we think about biblical uh, eschatology, eschatology just means the study of the last things. We often call it the end times. When we think about what the Bible teaches about the end times, there's really three things that you need to believe. You need to believe that Jesus is coming again bodily to this earth. He is coming. Number two, you need to believe that there will be a final judgment. That all people will answer for what they have done. Whether good or bad, the Bible says we will answer for it on the last day. And then number three, you need to believe that there is an eternal place called heaven and an eternal place called hell. You need to know that Jesus is coming back. There will be a final judgment and there is an eternal heaven and an eternal hell. And everyone will spend their eternity in one of those two places. Outside of that, Christians can disagree. We can disagree about the events that might lead up to the return of Jesus or if there will be any events that lead up to the return of Jesus. We can argue about when the rapture might take place and will Christians go through the great tribulation. We can argue about the millennium and is that a real period of time after Jesus comes to the earth that he rules on the earth before the final state. Or some might say, well, I think he's just going to come and eternity is going to be ushered in and that's basically it. These are the basic disagreements that Christians might have when we discuss the end times and, and they're all collegial debates within the body of Christ. You can take different positions on that and be a member of this church and fellowship with other believers. These are, these are not essential doctrines. Now, I have my positions on them and, and I will be presenting some of that this morning throughout the sermon, but, but I want you to know that it's okay to disagree about some of the specifics. But you need to be absolutely certain Jesus is coming again. You will stand before Him in the judgment like every other person who has ever lived and you will spend eternity either in an eternal heaven if you have trusted in Christ or eternal hell if you have not trusted in Jesus. That is the biblical theology that we must believe. The rest of the details it's okay to disagree about. Not that the Bible doesn't tell us some of these things, but that they are difficult to understand. Uh, they are interpreted in different ways, and, and that's okay. Now, Daniel 12. We are finishing the last vision of the book of Daniel, which started in chapter 10. And we left off last week at the end of chapter 11 where we saw the, the coming Antichrist and his reign. Now, that was in verses 11, 36 to 45. And so we saw that after the, the, the time of the Persian and Greek rulers, which took place from chapter 11, verses 2 to 35, then in verse 36 comes this 
end times wicked ruler that the Bible calls the Antichrist and, and he will persecute God's people as they've never been persecuted before. He will launch a, a worldwide campaign and cause wars upon the earth. And then in chapter 12, verse 1, picking up on this prophecy about the Antichrist who will come at the end of the days, Daniel continues in chapter 12, verse 1, and he says, at that time. At what time? Well, the same time he was just talking about in verses 36 to 45 of chapter 11, like verse 40, at the time of the end, right? So he continues in chapter 12, verse 1, at that time, the same time that he's been talking about at the end of chapter 11, the end times, the time of the end. So he says in chapter 12, verse 1, continuing the prophecy of what will happen at the end of the Great Tribulation, at the end of the persecution that the Antichrist will bring upon God's people, at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never been since there was a nation at that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. Now verse 1 has enough information in it alone to be a sermon. Uh, we will just look at this quickly and I'll explain what's happening here. Notice that at the very end times as the, the persecution becomes just unbearable and the great tribulation reaches its height, at that time will arise Michael the great prince. He's called the archangel in the New Testament. Uh, the, the term arch is the term in Greek for ruler. And so Michael is a, is a head angel, a, a ruler of the other angels. He, he's a leader among God's angels. The chief angel as it were. He is the great prince and he has charge of your people. Which is to say that, that God's angels do God's bidding and one of the things that, that God is going to do in response to the Antichrist and the persecution of believers throughout the world is he's going to command his angels to respond. In what way we're not told, but the angels are, are going to respond. And Michael, the leader of these angels, is, is going to lead God's angels to care for God's people in this time of great persecution. So we're not told anything else about that other than the fact that God is not going to leave His people alone in this very brief period of time at the end of history that the Bible calls the Great Tribulation, but that Michael and the other angels will be in some way ministering to and working on behalf of God's people to help them. And we are told about this time and how horrible it will be. There shall be a time of trouble such as has never been since there was a nation until that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Now, as I said earlier, it is good to read the later books of the Bible so that you can better understand the earlier books of the Bible. Daniel was written in the 530s B.C. At the end of, of the period of the exile before God's people and at the time when God's people were coming back from exile and coming back to Jerusalem. So around 530 B.C., Daniel's prophecy is written and completed. And then over 500 years later, Jesus is standing in Jerusalem before the temple with His apostles and I want you to listen to the words of Jesus as he interprets all of these things in the book of Matthew, chapter 24. This is called the Olivet Discourse. It's contained in Matthew 24 and Mark 13. And here Jesus is explaining the events that Daniel prophesies from Daniel 9 all the way through Daniel 12 specifically the events concerning the Antichrist and the Great Tribulation. Listen to Jesus, Matthew 24, verse 15. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, now that is in Daniel 9, 24 to 27, the abomination of desolation. It was previously mentioned 
in Daniel 9. We are told that there will be this, this thing that Daniel calls the abomination of desolation at the very end of history. Okay? So Jesus explains Daniel's prophecy, and he mentions Daniel by name in Matthew 24, verse 15. When you see the things that Daniel spoke about standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Jesus is saying, read Daniel carefully. He's telling you of future things that will happen. There will be this one who commits an abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. Who is that? Well, that's the Antichrist. And Daniel says he's going to get rid of all other religions and all other gods and he's going to demand that everyone worship him. And I believe that is the abomination of desolation. He, he gets rid of all earthly religions. He commands people to no longer worship their God, be he Allah or be he Jesus, the true God. And everyone must worship the Antichrist. Now, of course, true Christians cannot abide by that. We are going to worship Jesus no matter what some world ruler tells us, and therefore we will be greatly persecuted for refusing to stop worshiping Jesus. And so then we are told in Matthew 24, verse 16, what will happen as Christians do not bow down to the Antichrist in His command that you stop worshiping Christ and worship Him, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let the one who is on the housetop not go down and take what is in his house and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. Why are people running? Because they are going to be terribly persecuted. Verse 19, And alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing in those days, pray that your flight may not be in the winter or in the Sabbath. Uh, those with small children will have it the worst at any time of suffering, be it a, in the aftermath of a hurricane or, or, or even far worse, the Great Tribulation. If you have small children and you go through these hard times, it, it's even more difficult because you're trying to care for the children as you care for yourself. Verse 20, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. Verse 21, for then there will be great tribulation. After the abomination of desolations is committed and the Antichrist commands people not to worship their God, specifically not to worship Jesus, but to worship Him instead. Christians are going to refuse. They can't do that. And then in response to Christians' refusal to worship the Antichrist, or as the book of Revelation puts it, to take the mark of the beast, which I don't think is a literal mark that's going to be put on people's foreheads. I preach through that in the book of Revelation. But simply, Christians are going to refuse to worship anyone other than Jesus. And in response to that, many Christians will be persecuted and killed. So Jesus explains there will be great tribulation. This word tribulation means persecution. That's how it's generally translated and understood throughout the New Testament. There will be great tribulation or great persecution, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. Now look back at what we read in Daniel 12.1. There shall be a time of trouble, such as has never been since there was a nation until that time. That's Daniel 12.1. Now look again at Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 21. Then there will be great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and will never be. Why is Jesus using almost the exact same language that Daniel used in chapter 12, verse 1? Here's your answer. Jesus is explaining Daniel 12. Here in Matthew 24, Jesus, the Son of God Himself who authored Scripture ultimately because it's God's Word, is explaining to us what Daniel 12 means. And I've got a lot of commentaries in my office, but the best commentary you could ever have is Jesus Himself telling you what His own Word means. That's pretty good. That's, a re that's an inspired commentary. So listen to what Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 24, verse 22. And if those days, what days? The, the days of the Great Tribulation. If those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. 
the, the, the warfare and the suffering would be so terrible that if it were allowed to go on too long, it literally would kill all the inhabitants of the earth. That's how horrible it's going to be. So if the days had not been cut short, no human would be saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Who are the elect? Well, throughout the New Testament, the elect are God's people, Christians. Literally, the chosen, the ones whom God has saved, those who belong to Jesus. This is one of the reasons I, I just cannot believe that Christians will escape the persecution during the Great Tribulation because Jesus tells us here in Matthew 24, verse 22, that the reason the Great Tribulation will be cut short is for the sake of the elect Christians who will be on the earth in that day. And Jesus limits the time of suffering for their sake. Verse 23, And then if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there He is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. But you can't lead astray, God's sheep. And the elect, Christians, are not going to buy it, Jesus says. And He's talking about deception that will be attempted during the Great Tribulation. People will try to say to Christians, oh, there He is, there Jesus is, don't believe it. Jesus says in verse 25 of Matthew 24, See, I have told you beforehand. I'm telling you about this because there will be a generation of Christians who live through these events. And so if you're in that generation in that day, you need to know. So if they say to you, look, He's in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, He's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Which is to say, when Jesus comes back, you'll know it. It's like when lightning strikes. When lightning strikes in front of you on the ground, you don't say, was that lightning? You know it was lightning. There's nothing else like it. Amen? I mean, when Jesus comes back, you won't have to say, is this Jesus? You'll know it's Jesus. You won't have to ask. And if you have to ask, it's not Jesus. Because no one's going to wonder who it is when Jesus comes back. The Bible says every eye will see Him when He returns. The Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. When Jesus comes back, everyone will know it's Jesus. Even atheists will admit that they were wrong. And so back in Daniel 12, Daniel is, is telling us about a coming time at the very end of history, at the time of the end, when there will be trouble and persecution like never before, worse than any previous time in human history, worse than World War II, worse than the persecutions in ancient kingdoms like Rome and Greece and Persia, worse than anything that's ever taken place in human history. And then Daniel 12, 1, we are told, but at that time your people shall be delivered. Now, some dispensationalists who believe that Christians will not go through the Great Tribulation say, at that time your people shall be delivered. Your people is not referring to Christians, it's referring to Jews because Daniel's Jewish and Daniel's people are the Jewish people. And so they try to say here in Daniel 12, verse 1, that the people who are delivered are, are Jews who are going to be saved during the time of the Great Tribulation. Problem with that is, is look who the next phrase in verse 1, at the end of verse 1, says who the people of Daniel are. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. What book are we talking about? What, what, what book, Daniel? This is the first time in the Bible that the book in which people's names who belong to God are written down. But once again, that Reformation principle, Scripture interprets Scripture, will tell us what the book mentioned in Daniel 12 verse 1 is. Would you like to hear what it is? Let's look at the book of Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Paul tells us what the book that Daniel mentions in chapter 12 verse 1 is. Philippians 4 verse 3. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women. He's talking about these women in the Philippian church 
who have labored side by side with me in the gospel with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. That's the next time it's mentioned in the Bible. The, the book, and here it's called the book of life, in which the name of the believers in Philippi are written down. So, so the Philippian Christians, the, the, the people in that church, Paul says, your names are written in God's book of life. And that's the book that Daniel mentioned in Daniel 12, verse 1. And then we move over to the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 8. And we are told of what will happen during the time of the Great Tribulation when the, the, the beast who is the false prophet, uh, excuse me, the beast who is the Antichrist, excuse me, the, the beast in the book of Re Revelation is the Antichrist who is persecuting God's people. Okay? And we are told about how the whole world is going to worship the beast, worship the Antichrist, which is what Daniel told us, of course. And the only ones who won't worship will be who? Well, let, let John in Revelation, we'll start in chapter 13, verse 7, tell you who will not worship the Antichrist during the Great Tribulation. Revelation 13, verse 7, and it, it is the beast from verse 5. The beast is the Antichrist. And it, the beast, the Antichrist, was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. Remember, he's persecuting Christians. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. He, he, he dominates the world. He, he, he launches a worldwide war campaign and he has authority over the nations of the world. Verse 8. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it. All who dwell on the earth will worship the beast, the Antichrist. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain. Amen. Who is going to worship the Antichrist? Everyone who's not a Christian. And the only ones who will refuse to bow down to the Antichrist and worship him during the time of the Great Tribulation will be those whose names were written before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain. Christians are going to refuse to bow down to the Antichrist because we worship Jesus and Him alone. And no government can tell us not to or to worship someone else. We will not bow. You can take our lives, but you cannot take our faith. It's also interesting that Revelation 13.8 says that your name was written down in the book of life before the foundation of the world, before creation. A lot of times you may have heard a preacher say, well, you know, when you get saved, your, your name at that moment is written in the Lamb's book of life. That's wrong. Revelation 13.8 and 17.8, which I'll show you in a moment, says that those whose names were written in the Lamb's book of life were written in the book before the foundation of the world. God knew who He was going to save before He ever created the heavens and the earth. And he wrote your name down in his book before he said, let there be light. He set his love on you to save you and redeem you and spend eternity with you before the foundation of the world. We see this again in Revelation 17, verse 8. Revelation 17, verse 8 says, The beast that you saw, remember the beast is the Antichrist, the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction and the dwellers of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel at the beast because it was and is not and is to come. Once again, John says there's going to be this figure rise up called the beast, the Antichrist. And everyone's going to worship him except for those whose names were written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. Okay. Now that we've finished Daniel 12, 1, we can uh, finish the rest of the chapter, which will go faster. But I want you to see how what Daniel writes here in chapter 12 is interpreted by the rest of the Bible, especially the New Testament. So Daniel 12, verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. 
There's going to be a resurrection. Now, in Revelation 20, we're told that there will be two of these resurrections. The first one is of believers, the second one of unbelievers. Daniel just puts them together here in verse 2. Those who sleep in the dust of the earth, those who have died throughout human history, at that time they shall awake. This is why when we bury someone, we say that this is a temporary resting place for their body. One day, Jesus is coming back and this body will rise out of this grave. Those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. They will be resurrected. They will come back to life. Everyone will. Now some of those who are resurrected will be resurrected to everlasting life, eternal life. They will spend eternity in heaven and some to everlasting shame and contempt. They will spend eternity in hell. And it's one of the two. You're either a child of God, a believer in Jesus Christ, and when you are raised on that last day, you will go to everlasting life, or if you have not known Jesus... You will die in your sin. You will be judged according to what your sins deserve. You, like everyone else, is a guilty sinner before a holy God and you will be found guilty before God and worthy of eternal contempt. Eternal hell. And the only difference between those who go to heaven and those who go to hell is that those who go to heaven have trusted in Jesus. They're not any better they're not any less sinful. They're just saved by God, from God's wrath, for God's glory. Verse 3. And those who are wise, who are the ones who are wise? Believers. Those who didn't waste this life but lived it for Jesus. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. Their sins will be washed away. When you look upon them, they are clothed in white linens, we are told in Revelation 19. They are clothed with the righteousness of Christ, and they will shine like the brightness of the sky. And those who turn many to righteousness, in other words, Christians share that gospel while they are on the earth and lead other people to faith in Christ. The Bible knows nothing of a Christian who doesn't lead other people to faith in Christ. I just want you to know that. A non-evangelizing Christian is a contradiction in terms. So if you're uncomfortable sharing your faith, I just want you to understand it's not an option. And the Bible expects you as a Christian to tell others about Jesus. And if you keep the gospel to yourself we must begin to question, do you really understand it? Because this good news is too good to keep to yourself. And if you're keeping the good news to yourself, do you really understand it? And have you truly received it? We are told that those who are wise, Christians, will turn many to righteousness. Like the stars forever and ever, those whom they lead to faith will be with them forever and ever in heaven. And shine like the stars. Verse 4, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. All these things are going to happen when? In the time of the end. Now when he says seal the book, this is picked up on in, in Revelation 4 and 5. It's my favorite passage in the whole Bible. And I won't go into it, but you'll remember that, that there was a scroll sealed with seven seals that's introduced in Revelation 4. And then in chapter 5 of Revelation, there's only one who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals. He is the Lamb. He's the Lion of the tribe of Judah who is standing there as a Lamb, though he had been slain. And he begins to open the seals. And the seals... It's, it's, it's containing God's plans for all of human history and the culmination of God's plans for history. So the fact that the book is sealed up, it means that God planned out all the events of history, especially the end of time, from creation. And one day, the, the book that has been sealed will be opened and the, and the end will be brought to its completion and Jesus will rule and reign forever. So Daniel, seal the book. God has planned these things. Write it down and seal it up until the time of the end when all of this will be fulfilled. And Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Run to and fro is a, a Hebraism. It's, it, it's not a compliment in the Hebrew language. 
it's kind of like the English phrase, run around like a chicken with your head cut off. It's not a compliment if someone says you're doing that. To run to and fro is to go through this life searching for meaning and purpose from one thing to the next, never finding it. And God tells us here that the world is going to run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. They'll have a lot of knowledge. They'll, they'll, they'll make scientific advancements. They'll be smart. They'll just be spiritually foolish. But we're not saying that, 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 that people aren't smart. Intellectually, they have an incredible capability to create things and medicine and, 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 and the things that, that, that humanity has done on this earth really are amazing. But they're running to and fro. They're looking for meaning and purpose in all the wrong places and they will not find it because they aren't looking to Jesus. And then one day the end's going to come. And your car, your technology, your cell phone, it won't matter anymore. Verse 5, Then I, Daniel, looked and behold, two others stood, one on this side of the bank of the stream and one on the other side of the bank of the stream. Remember, Daniel's having a, a vision and now he sees two more angels standing there in the vision. Verse 6, And someone said to the man clothed in linen, he was introduced in chapter 10 at the beginning of the vision. Someone said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream, How long shall it be until the end of these wonders? How long until the end comes? Isn't that the question we all want answered? How long until all this happens? How long until the end of time? Verse 7, And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives there forever that it would be for time, times, and half a time. And that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things will be fulfilled. What is time, times, and half a time? Well, it adds up to three and a half in Hebrew. And it's been mentioned previously in Daniel 9 and Daniel 7. It's mentioned throughout the book of Revelation. It's the time of the great tribulation, this short, intense period of persecution that Jesus, in Matthew 24, calls the great tribulation. And what we're told here is that the end will not come until God's people go through the great tribulation. And then after that, that intense period of suffering, time, times, and half a time, it's less than one lifetime, it's a short period of time, then after that, all these things will be fulfilled and the end comes. So the great tribulation happens immediately before Jesus comes back and the end of all things is consummated. So, verse 8, I heard, but I did not understand. Have you ever felt like Daniel? You read these things in the Bible and you go, you know, I read it, but I don't understand it. Well, don't feel bad because Daniel did that sometimes too, okay? Daniel just says, look, angels, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know what you're talking about, okay? I mean, I heard what you said, but it didn't make any sense. It's okay if that happens. What do you do if you don't understand all that the Bible says about the end times? Well, Daniel's going to show you. Then I said, oh, my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? Okay, I don't understand it. Can you just tell me how it's going to end? I mean, I don't understand the details, but can you just give me the big picture? What's going to happen? What do I need to know? What do I need to take away from what the Bible says about the end times? Here's what you need to know. Verse 9, he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Daniel, live your life. Live it for Jesus. Go your way. These things are sealed. They're going to happen. Verse 10, Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined. Let me just translate that for you. Many will be saved. Before the end comes, many will be saved. Many will purify themselves and make themselves white and refined. Many will come to faith in Christ and so be saved. But the wicked shall act wickedly. While more people come to faith in Christ and are saved, the world is going to get more and more wicked. Has anybody noticed that lately? This world ain't becoming more like Jesus, right? That's going to happen. This world is not going to stop its wicked ways. I just want you to know that. It's going to get worse and worse and worse until Jesus comes back. But in the meantime, many will be saved through it all. And none of the wicked shall understand. This world does not understand, does it? 
I mean, the foolish things that this world believes in. There are people today who believe that men can give birth to a baby and they claim to believe in science? It's incredible how stupid our culture has become. The wicked do not understand. But those who are wise shall understand. Those who know Jesus know better. And we're not taken captive by the lies of this world. We're not deceived like this world is deceived. We're not going to listen to this foolishness that our world is propagating. Verse 11. And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away, the time when the Antichrist comes and says, you can't worship anyone else, you have to worship me. From the time when the Antichrist comes and wipes out all world religions and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, he demands to be worshipped by everyone, there shall be 1,290 days, which is about three and a half years. The Great Tribulation. There's going to be an intense period of persecution after the Antichrist comes. Verse 12, Blessed is he who waits and arrives at 1,335 days. What is that? I'm not exactly sure, but it's 1,290 plus 45, which I think is basically saying you get on the other side of the Great Tribulation, it's going to be a lot better. <laughs> Jesus comes back. Okay? And, and I think that's the meaning of 1,335. Just wait through the interiorance an intense period of suffering, the Great Tribulation. And on the other side, blessed is he who arrives at the 1,335 days. In other words, Jesus comes back, kills the Antichrist, ushers in the eternal state. Right? When you get to the other side, it's going to be okay. Verse 13, but go your way till the end. Live your life for Jesus until the end comes. And you don't know when it's going to come. Just live for Jesus. Go your way until the end and you shall rest. Are you tired? So am I. But one day Jesus is coming and our souls will have rest. You shall rest. And you shall stand in your allotted place. What is your allotted place? The place that Jesus went to heaven to prepare for you. And He said that I am going there to prepare a place for you. And I am coming again so that where I am you may be also. And Daniel says you have an allotted place in heaven kept for you that will be fully and finally revealed at the end of the days. Now this is all the answer to Daniel's question. Look, I don't understand all this end time stuff. Angels, could you just break it down for me? What do I need to do? Because I don't really understand the details. Wait, be faithful to Jesus, live your life for Jesus. He's coming again and you will go to eternal heaven. That's what you need to know about the end times, brothers and sisters. It's really not that complicated. Live for Jesus until you die or He comes to get you. But at the end of this life, eternal heaven awaits those who trust in Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We will have rest. And we will find our rest in Thee, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank You for the book of Daniel, for Your Word, which reminds us and reassures us that Jesus is coming and all the sufferings of this world are short and temporary, but heaven is eternal. And we will have rest on that day. Lord, as your word says in Galatians 6, verse 8, let us not grow weary of doing good. Lord, to just be honest, we often feel tired and worn out, like we can't go on, and God, we, we know we have to go on. You've called us to go through these things for your glory, and you have promised us that rest awaits us on the other side of this life. So, Father, help us run the race well for Jesus until he comes again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.